So nothing will send your life in a downward tailspin straight to the bottom of the barrel, quite like grief. So let's talk about death. My father, uh, he kind of committed suicide on my 35th birthday about two years ago. And you all can take that as a content warning for what's about to follow. Because one of the more complicated questions that lingers on after you survive a loved one's suicide is, am I even allowed to talk about this with people? Now, in the beginning, when you're first experiencing the sudden and tragic loss of someone that you love, uh, you tend to go into shock. And for that first month, there's just so much shit that you gotta do that there's no time to process or grieve. And in the first few days, you have friends and family members coming out of the woodwork to force upon you their sympathy. You're getting phone calls from people that you don't even know every half hour with infinite blessings, thoughts, and prayers. It's overwhelming and a bit intrusive. These people that you don't even know will get hurt and upset if you're not answering these phone calls. You can't even go to the bathroom without these people that you don't even know getting upset and worrying whether you're okay enough to wipe. And then there's the awkward conversations with coworkers and acquaintances who've heard the rumors. And they ask you and you tell them and you see the immediate look of regret on their face because talking about suicide makes people uncomfortable. They're curious about the details, but they don't want to know the details, which makes you want to give them all of the bloody details just to spite that. And for that first month, you're just so lost in a fog that you almost want to be left alone. And when those first 30 days are up, you get your wish because everyone else moves on. And now they expect you to be okay when you're not because things only get worse. Uh, the numbness wears off and all of it's replaced with all manner of extreme emotions. Now you can't sleep because you're having panic terrors. Now you're having random panic attacks and you're self-medicating heavily. No one's bringing groceries over anymore, and you're paranoid that people are avoiding you, so you're pushing else, everyone else away. And things get so bad that they can only get better when your blood pressure and cholesterol are both dangerously high, and you realize that it's time to make some serious life changes, and you come to an epiphany. I came to mind on Martin Luther King Day this year. I was home, off from work, and drunk, and I decided to book a trip to get away on the one-year anniversary. I woke up the next day to all of these email receipts thinking, oh no, drunk Greg, what the fuck did you do now? <laughs> oh, well, this is pretty good, drunk Greg. I'm pretty proud of you, drunk Greg, but uh, maybe we shouldn't be so drunk anymore. I had booked a trip to the Grand Canyon because my father always told me that he wanted to hike to the bottom when he retired. And I had been staring at the bag of his ashes in my apartment since he died, not knowing what to do with them. He always told me to flush him down the toilet when he was dead, and it was a struggle every day not to do just that. But now I knew what I was gonna do. I was gonna take him to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. The trip itself was a complete and utter fucking nightmare. Everything that could have went wrong, went wrong. I got grounded for a day on the way over due to turbulence. I got drugged. I had nothing but terrible weather, got snowed in in Bumblefuck, Arizona. But when I finally made it to the Grand Canyon after driving over from New Mexico in a souped up V8 SS Camaro, I knew I made the right decision. Now, I might have been able to walk to the bottom because of the snow, but it was majestic nonetheless. And I was told about a secluded trail that led to a secret peak that would be the best place to give him a proper send off. So on the morning of March 15th, 2019, I woke up and made a big old mess in my hotel bathroom, trying to funnel his ashes from this giant 25 pound bag to all these small scattering containers, <laughs> only to realize like it'd just be easier to keep them in the bag. I did pour a few spoonfuls of the old bastard down the toilet just to honor his wishes. And then I spent the day hiking the canyon with him on my back and around dusk I made my way on that secluded trail in the snow to that secret peak. And when I got there there was a couple already hanging out and I was thinking, ah, damn it. But they saw me standing there awkwardly chain smoking with this big bag of ashes and it was probably pretty obvious what I was there to do. So they left me to give me my privacy, both hugging me without saying anything. I made my way to the edge, and just as I did, and opened that bag, the winds picked up, and yeah, I had a big Lebowski moment. Everywhere. Asshole just wouldn't let me have that moment. 
But the winds were so strong that I learned that you only needed to hold the bag horizontally, and it carried them out over the canyon. Eerily enough, the winds died out the moment the bag was empty, and I had my words. I screamed and cursed and cried the hardest since the night that it happened, and then I forgave them. And then I ran like hell back to my car because it was getting dark and I fucking saw mountain lion tracks <laughs> in the trail. Now, I've made about as much peace with all of it as a person possibly can. I still have my bad days. I'm sure I can expect those for years to come. But I'm certainly in a better place today than I was a year ago. And I want to thank you for letting me talk about this because I still don't fucking know if I'm allowed to talk about this.